Welcome to Sales Velocity TV, where we pull back the curtain on how the top businesses in the world sell more with less resistance. Bringing over 50 plus years of combined sales experience and over 100 million in revenue generated, please welcome the hosts of Sales Velocity TV and two incredibly entertaining gentlemen, Andrew Cass and Aaron Parkinson. Alrighty, welcome to episode one of Sales Velocity Radio. My friend, how are you? Well, episode one, I'm pretty excited. You know, episode you've done a, a ton of work here prepping all of the uh, look at that intro, bro. It's good uh, stuff. You know, it's professional. You stuff. know, what my favorite part is though, two very entertaining gentlemen. That's quite a compliment. Well, and that's yet to be seen. It, I guess we'll wait. We'll wait for, for feedback to see. We're going to have true. to prove concept on that. But welcome everybody. This is the first episode of Sales Velocity TV. It's also a radio version, so this will be podcast as well as live in our Facebook group. Uh, this is Andrew Cast. That's Aaron Parkinson, and we are going to be talking sales, and uh, not the kind of sales I think you think we're going to be talking about. We're really going to be talking about sales as the you know, as what it should be, really, the nucleus of any successful company, they are sales-driven business owners and entrepreneurs. And you and I go back to, we, we joke about this, we go back to being entrepreneurs and business owners in the pre-social media, pre-Google, pre-video days. So we're like old school guys, but yet we operate in new school. And now I think it's probably safe to say, Aaron, that we are a really good combination of both new school and old school when it comes to successfully selling in the 21st century. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to describe it. I mean, the fundamentals are always the same, you know, and if you if you listen to people like Mark Cuban, you know, he's famous for saying things like sales cure all, right? And yeah. everybody, you know, everybody likes to talk about what makes a business successful, but the cornerstone always has to be, can you sell it? Mm -hmm. And people are always looking at the the sales you know, perspective, I think as, as the old car sales, you know, kind of hustle aggressive, right? The hustle aggressive, you know, and they're like, Ooh, sales, that's a dirty word. Or but I could never do that. Is, right. That's not me. Yeah, exactly. That's not me. And, and, and I don't want to sell and blah, 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 blah. But the reality is, is that if nobody wants to buy your stuff, then your business sucks. And <laughs> to, if, put it, if, to put it bluntly, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to put it bluntly, right, you know, and, and it's all about changing that perspective of how sales are done, what sales is, what are the technologies that help you facilitate it, right? Because all, all, all sales is, is somebody feeling good about buying into you and your business, right. feeling good about supporting you. Feeling good about choosing you over somebody else. Feeling good about giving you their money versus somebody else. You could almost transition the word sales to like love. You know what I mean? In, in a really weird context where it's like, hey, I could buy my car from anybody, but I want to buy it from you. I want to give you the money. I want to choose you over everybody else. You know, I could choose to spend my time on any other social network, but I'm choosing to spend my time on Instagram because I love the Instagram platform more than I love the Facebook platform or the yeah, Twitter platform fair. or, you know, whatever. Fair. Right? It, it, it's, it's creating that synergy between the, the customer and the company. And without it, you don't have a business. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like a transfer of enthusiasm, right? I think it was Jim exactly. Rohn or Zig Ziglar back in the day. So I'm, you know, as you know, Aaron, but probably a lot of the viewers don't know. So I got my start in sales at the age of 19 years old. So I came out of college before I graduated in May of 1995. Now you know my age. May of 1995, um, I had a sales job on Long Island. I was an outside sales rep on Long Island for a, an electronic hardware company. I was hired as a 21-year-old kid. Not even, I was 20. I was about to turn 21 with great salary, benefits, company car, cell phone at the time, which they were this big. They were like bricks, right? So cell phone in the car at the time company expense card. Like I was like the true outside sales guy. I actually had a phone card because they didn't give me the phone right away. I had to stop at pay phones to make calls. It was, it was crazy. Right. And I was listening to Zig Ziglar cassette tapes, by the way, like all of what we're talking about doesn't even exist today. Like if there's anybody below the age of 25, listening to this, they're like, what hemisphere are these guys living in phone cards, you know, going to pay phones, right? That's how we operated in, in, in or at least me in an outside sales role. So that was me coming out of college and I, that was door to door 
showing up at companies, presenting what it is that we offered. So it was B2B sales. And that was how I got my start. So I had to, I didn't have the tools that we have today, which we'll talk about in a minute here in episode one. We're going to talk fittingly new school versus old school. We're going to talk about lead generation back then, kind of pre-internet and lead generation today, which is a whole new world, a whole new frontier when it comes to internet. But that's how I got my start. And then obviously I just transitioned into other sales roles or other you know, business ownership roles. But at the end of the day, everything that I did from there um, was centered around really good, sophisticated sales processes or nothing works. So really, I think the big, the big lesson or the big goal of the show here is to show you how to sell more, the tagline, with less resistance, meaning you're putting processes and systems in place, which we're going to show you what works and what doesn't essentially, so that your business can become a sales machine without feeling like you're, you were me back in the day where I had to kind of you know, do all the grunt work and show up and knock on doors and do, do anything cold. You and I don't do anything cold today at all, which means with whatever business we're running or whatever client work we're doing, people or prospects are coming to us preconditioned to buy because the marketing has been established correctly in the beginning. So I think probably we're going to talk more so about strategic marketing always precedes a great selling process because people then come to you preconditioned to buy if you've marketed to them and positioned yourself correctly in what it is that you do. And today with social media and video and social and all the things we didn't have when we started, you now have today, which means you can really ramp things up nicely and put a really nice process in place. So that's probably, you know, what we're going to segue into here a little bit, but you agree, I'm sure. Yeah. I, the, the fundamentals are always still the same. The difference is now the technology makes it significantly easier, mm. right? Because when, you know, when I first started doing sales, I actually started doing them over the phone and I was 23 and you still had to establish the same things that you have to establish now. Yeah. Right. You have to establish that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. You have to educate the prospect that there's a solution and then you have to build rapport with the prospect so that they trust you enough to believe that the solution that you're offering them really is going to solve that problem. And you have to break down that resistance and then you've got to find a way for them to bond with you so that ultimately they separate with their money or their credit card and they feel good enough to do that transaction. And then you have to put systems in place to reinforce that decision and ultimately get them to do business with you in a repeat fashion. Yep. Because we all know it's 10 times easier to sell somebody who's already done business with you and 10 times cheaper to acquire that, that sale than it is to do it cold. Mm. Right? And, and we talk about this on a one-on-one -on -one level, and we talk about this on a, on a global level, you know, we have clients doing $10,000 a month. We have clients doing a million plus a month. And it's the same things in every company. It's just about putting the things in place and systemizing them and optimizing them to make it really as predictable and boring as possible. Mm -hmm. Right? And when we look at, you know, when we first got started and there was no training and there was very limited technology and there was all those things, we had to do all of those things cold in under 30 minutes, whether it was showing up live to a business and breaking through, you know, the guards at the front door or whether it was outbound or inbound calls where we had to do the exact same thing in 30 minutes. Yep. And now the world, you know, the access to information and the access technology and the ability to put value into the marketplace and the ability to the ability to tra attract people to you is so much better than it was, you know, even five years ago, oh, let alone God, 10 yeah. years ago or 15 years ago, that it, it's almost become easy at this point. I, I hate to use that word because everyone's like, oh, it's, it's, it's tough to sell. It's not tough to sell. Well, there's a difference between easy and simple, right? So everybody kind of right. wants the easy button today. So technology is a double-edged sword, as we know, right? Everybody wants the easy button today. Technology makes things easier. Um, but there's a difference between easy and simple, right? We want a simple sales process, but it probably won't be easy to get one, right? It's going to be tough to get one. But, but ultimately, we want to make it simple so that it isn't too complex for you and your team, and it also doesn't overwhelm and turn off the prospect, right? So the easy, simple equation is something that you need to be aware of for sure. You and I go back to 2007 or 8-ish when we built a sales, we met building a sales system for a company. And we ended yep. up building, it was your company. I was, you were, you were a founder and a partner. I was, I guess, sort of a junior partner, director level, kind of beneath you guys, right? It's how we met. 
And yep. we built an internet marketing system for a company that ultimately went on to do, I don't know, you probably know the numbers better than I do, 30, 40, 50 million in sales. Yep. I think ultimately this system helped them do somewhere in that number over about a three year time span. Yeah, it was right? an education company. Yeah, internet marketing and financial education company. Yeah, so that's where we met. Now, this was when Google was the only game in town. So talking lead generation then versus lead generation now. So again, Google was the only game in town. And of course, Yahoo, right? Google and Yahoo were the only game in town. There was no video. There was no social media. So we got to those numbers with just a couple forms of media where now today there's probably 30 times more media in addition Easy. to Google and in addition to Yahoo. So does that make it easier or does that make it harder today? So some people go, oh, that makes it way easier because there's so many more choices today. But then yet it's way harder because there's so many more choices today. And that's what I want to deconstruct a little bit with everybody here today, because I think it's really important because sometimes more isn't better. I know that default thinking, human nature thinking is more is better, more is better. We have more choices. It must be easier. It actually is sort of counterintuitive. Sometimes you have to be careful of taking on too many forms of media because then you kind of get scattered as a jack of all trades and a master of none in doing lead gen. Yeah. And, and I think this all just comes down to levels of automation. Right. Because the same things that worked, t you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago still work today. Yeah. You can still same walk. Psychology. Yeah. And it's not just the psychology. You can literally do the same things. I think it might be a little bit more dangerous, <laughs> but <laughs> you can still walk door to door, banging doors. People you still can still do walk, it. you know, business to business. Yep. Trying to get trying to get, you know, a, a face to face with the owner. Right. You can still place signs on the side of the road. You can still place ads in newspapers and magazines. Mm -hmm. You you can still have, you know, meetings that you invite people to. All, all of the basic stuff is still it still works. Somebody's still doing it successfully. I, I guarantee we could find somebody who's laughing at everybody else trying to, you know, do these big media campaigns and automate everything and they're like, man, this is all I do. You know, I, there's this guy named Caleb. I was uh, on a call with him a couple of weeks ago, and he's still selling supplements in newspapers. And I'm thinking to myself, is he really? I'm like, killing it. And I'm like, how are you selling supplements in newspapers? Is nobody that, reading? That's the only form of media, just the newspaper. Yeah, that's it. Wow. That's it. So there's and, something to be said for the power of one, focusing on one form of media, newspapers and media. He's expert at one. And I'm expert thinking to myself, who reads newspapers anymore? And he's like, well, the supplement market is an older demographic market. True. The older demographic market still reads newspapers. I've got my ad down, you know, absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. It goes into my automated sales process. We sell all day long. Yep. Right. So he's, there's always going to be somebody still doing insanely successful sales in the things that were still happening five, 10, 15 years ago. I think for us where, where we start to look at all of these other options is we look at them from the perspective of scale and automation, right? You know, the, the more you want to scale, right? The bigger you want to become, the better your systems have to be, the more things have to be automated, the tighter your, your leaks, you know, need to become. Yep. We see this all the time. You know, we'll look at the progression of people through different types of sales processes and we can instantly diagnose where, the drop off is, and you've got to be able to see those things quickly and fix those and address them and put things in place. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it just comes down to how big do you want to be? Because there's somebody successful doing it small, medium, large, and almost every, you know, in every different facet. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. And for the guy with the newspapers, think about what he's doing in news. This is where a lot of people, there's a disconnect with lead generation, right? They go, well, if he's doing it in the newspaper, then he could never do it online. Or if he's doing it online, he could never do it in the newspaper. But the reality is, if it's working offline, it's probably going to work as good or better online because all he would need to do, as you know, is take the same advertising copy. And instead of driving them to perhaps a phone number like I'm guessing he's doing now, or maybe he's driving them to the web, to a website, website, I don't know. Online, Offline to online works phenomenal. So if he's driving yep. them from an ad in the newspaper to a web page where they go sign in to do lead gen, or maybe it's a, a sales page, I don't know. That's great. Or maybe he's driving them to a phone call, but no doubt he could take that same psychology, same concept, same ad set, and move it to a Google ad, a Facebook ad, an Instagram ad, even a YouTube video, and probably get 
a decent result. Maybe it's not as good as newspaper for him. I don't know. But the downside of a guy like that is, and, and this Dan Kennedy taught me this probably 10 years ago, is the most dangerous number in business is one. One form of media, one lead generation tactic, one strategy, one, one, one. Because if the one goes away, you're done. And you and I saw it firsthand when the Google slap hit in 2010. So we were teaching people how to advertise on Google to do lead generation back in 2007, 8, 9, 10. And then Google said, you know what? I think I want to change the rules of the game now. I don't want little guys on Google. I don't want internet marketers and affiliate marketers and information marketers on Google anymore. I want Nike Coach and Coca-Cola. I want yep. corporate money. I don't want independent entrepreneur money. Facebook will take your independent entrepreneur money all day long for now. For but now. do they ultimately be, and we saw this firsthand, so context here is important. We're going to bring this to you every single week is then and now you can learn a lot from history, right? What's the saying that, I don't know how it, how it goes, but there's a saying, Aaron, you'll probably remember that you can kind of learn everything you need to learn by looking at history. There, there's a way to phrase that. I'm not phrasing it correctly, but when we look at the history of Google being the main player on the internet for lead generation, when you and I met each other. And what we've seen happen since then between social media, new channels, video, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. God, there was MySpace probably was the pioneer that's not around. Today. TikTok reminds me now of MySpace then. We've pretty much seen it all. And no yep. doubt we've generated probably in excess of a couple hundred million in revenue combined with all the projects, companies, and offers we've put on the web. And we've been mainly internet. However, we are huge live event guys as well. So we've probably done a bigger job, in my opinion, of using the internet to get people to live events where we've ultimately sold the most because I believe that live events and in-person face-to-face is the greatest thing for people. And today people are, you know, at the time of this episode one, we're six months into the COVID-19 pandemic, whenever you may be watching this, and people are dying to get live into a workshop event mastermind type setting. And that is your greatest opportunity to connect with people, build relationships, and ultimately sell more of your stuff. And that's really, at the end of the day, where old school meets new school. And I think the businesses that struggle the most today, they don't connect the dots. They do one or the other. They're old school live only, no internet, or they're internet only and they don't do any live. And that's really, I think, what the the, the biggest benefit we're going to bring you every single week is making sure that you do what's working and utilize the best of not only one world, but all worlds. And in my opinion, it's a combination of offline and online. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, there's always going to be topics that come up on this show where we go off in different directions. That's the benefit of having a show, you know, and not having to, you know, be on CBS or NBC is we don't have to have the entire thing scripted and we can go whatever yeah. way we want to go to keep it. Nor would we want to be on those channels today, right? Good Lord. Right. No, and not just to keep it entertaining for, for people who are watching, but keep it entertaining for ourselves because I want to be entertained and I want to have fun doing this, you know, as well. Does that mean we can talk about football? We can talk about football whenever yes. you want to talk about football. We can talk about football. We can talk about mixed martial arts. We can oh talk boy. about money. We can All talk right. about, you know, vacations. We can talk about whatever. Hey, the but, lady in the front, the lady in the beginning said two entertaining guys. So I feel like we need to live up to that <laughs> at so, some point. You got to integrate that. To dovetail off of what you're saying, and I think yeah. this is the one big thing that people could take away. I think every show you need to have one big thing that you can take away. You know, and we're talking about lead generation today, Right. Go where people live, right? People do not live in one place, right? Right. And people get so, you know, hyper focused on their thing. You know, Mm -hmm. the reason why Caleb does newspapers is because the competition was so fierce online. He was like, what if I just went somewhere else where nobody was? It's yeah, it's a place strategy. People people were still living there. I'm talking about the customers still living there. He's like, well, the news, I mean, newspapers have gone down, but there's still people reading newspapers, right? Mm -hmm. So he, everybody was like, screw newspapers. We're going to the internet. He's like, well, let me go the other way and let me go back to newspapers where nobody is. And he found like a, a, a nice little hole. Should he stop his business right there and rely completely on newspapers? No, he should say, okay, great. I found a little honey hole here. You know, well, if newspapers worked, uh, maybe magazines work mm-hmm. or maybe the digital version of newspapers work or what other things are, are, are synergistic with that. Right. Yeah. And, and people live, we get like confirmation bias. We think wherever we go all the time is where everybody else goes. It's a really good right? point. Bing still has billions of visitors per year. But when was the last time that you went to Bing? 
And because you don't go to Bing, therefore you think you should never advertise on Bing because you're in your own head. And because you don't go to Bing, suddenly nobody goes to Bing and then you've eliminated a lead source. Right. That's, that's, the, that's that in your head too much thinking. Right. Yahoo. You brought up Yahoo. I can't remember the last time I was on Yahoo. It has to be a decade. I didn't even know they were still, still in business. billions of visitors. I, still, I, watched, I saw this thing the other day and it was like, do you remember DuckDuckGo? That thing's still going, right? Still has millions and millions and millions of visitors. S TikTok, same thing. TikTok mm -hmm. right now is putting out huge bonuses to I sign up that. with them and test yeah. out their advertising that. platform. And, and because I'm, you know, just over 40 at this point, I'm like, I ain't going on TikTok. So then boom, that gets eliminated. Right. Or I'm not going on Pinterest because I don't sit there like my wife all day long looking at, you know, different pictures of how to decorate the living room and like, blah, blah. clearly nobody that I would want would be there. The, the people you want are in all the places, right? So the key is finding what works in each one of them, locking it in, systemizing it, and then looking to expand into the next place where people might live and the next place where people might live and the next place. And this is how you, you, you put yourself in a position of lead abundance mm. versus lead insecurity. Yeah. And, right. and testing, right? I mean, testing. You don't know till you test. Of course. Right? Like you just in your head discounted two potentially profitable, maybe successful, maybe not forms of media, TikTok and whatever the other one was, Pinterest, I think. And maybe, mm -hmm. just maybe, you have a really low cost per lead and you maybe can acquire a customer for a decent number over there. But since we let our heads go to work on, well, I couldn't be there because I'm not there or I'm not looking at, Right. I had a guy, it's funny story. You mentioned TikTok. So in my office where I am in Florida, there's a couple lawyers in the building. There's a three, three story office where I am. And there's a lawyer guy, guy has become a friend of mine, really nice guy. And he's an immigration attorney. And he tells me true story. Coincidentally, you brought up TikTok. He tells me he's killing it as an immigration attorney on TikTok right now, generating leads. And he's now closed immigration deals. I think he has like a $1,500 product where he helps people obviously get get their green cards and citizenship and, and all that. TikTok, a lawyer, immigration. I'm like, what? How could that? I, I couldn't even do the math, Aaron. Right, because again, it's that, that confirmation bias. Yes. You're, in your mind, you're like, lawyers lawyers don't go on TikTok and people who want lawyers don't go on TikTok. And you know what? I was almost like arrogant about it when I was like, imagine that, right? Me being arrogant. I was almost arrogant about it when I was like, so do you think that by being on TikTok, it, and I said this in a polite way, I said, do you think it might kind of weaken your positioning a little bit? And I didn't mean it to be rude. I really meant it like, cause we've talked business a lot and he was, you know, going to hire me for some coaching at one point or consulting. And I thought, you know, does it, you know, could it possibly degrade your positioning in this field of all the schooling and, you know, you were a lawyer and I would never say that for any other form of media, but I just, when I think of TikTok, I have f f four nieces and a daughter and that's what I think TikTok is. And they're all under the age of 12. And I'm like up there for vacation this summer and everybody's dancing on TikTok. And I'm like, my daughter's never going on that thing first. Um, all my nieces are on it. And I'm like, what is happening with this? Like these dance moves. I don't really like where this is headed. So then he tells me a few weeks later that he's advertising on TikTok and he's closing sales. He's getting leads. And I was like, wow, I really need to. It's everything we're talking about right here. See how quick we discount it. And, and again, it could be a potentially profitable venue media. And, and, and you really Newspaper don't know until well. you test it. And, and, and the reality is, is it, I, I, and we should talk about this a little bit too, is that the same messaging doesn't work the same everywhere you put it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a common mistake that most people make. You know, I'm the CEO of Seven Mile Media. We have, you know, anywhere from 40 to 50 clients. They're all spending north of $1,000 a day on ads. So I get to see what's working all the time from that that lead generation messaging standpoint. And a prime example is we have a, a, an eight figure nutritional company that's killing it on Facebook, but the same messaging in YouTube is just falling flat. Mm. It's just not converting at all. Totally different form of media. Totally different form of media. Different right? type of well, viewer. You, each one of them is going to have their specific nuances because people are there for different reasons. Mm. There might be different age demographics. It might be more slanted male or female. It might be slanted younger or older. 
it, I mean, in this particular case, we were analyzing it going, wow, it's the same video, same campaign, same everything over here on Facebook. Why is the same video stuff not working on YouTube? And as we started to dissect it, it's because people are going to YouTube for a specific reason. They're going to YouTube almost like a search engine. Mm -hmm. They're saying, I want to learn about X, Y, Z. Where, you know, on Facebook and Instagram, they're just, you know, scrolling through, looking to be entertained. If something looks entertaining, you know, they might follow it down the rabbit hole and that, you know, there goes your lead generation. But on YouTube, it's a, it's a completely different frame of mind that they're coming to. It's much more intent based. Mm. So then you have to line yourself up with that intent based, you know, mindset. And, 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 and so it, that that's going to be the same thing on Pinterest or on TikTok or on a newspaper or in a magazine. I mean, I, I want to share this 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 story with you for a second, Andrew, because you're going to be like, "Wow!" So, would you buy a magazine right now? Like, I don't mean would you buy a magazine like to read, but let's let's ask that question too. Would you buy a magazine to read right now? Of course. Okay, I like picking up a magazine from time yeah, to time. Yeah, well, time to time. Usually when I'm traveling, like I'm going yeah, I went to, to Barnes and Nobles last one. week and grabbed one. Yeah, good old fashioned so, Barnes and Noble, still, still, still functioning. Yeah. Like I, I would, I don't, I don't, certainly don't read them as much as I used to, but I'll grab one from time to time. Right. So, one of my um, really, really good friends um, has a business right now, a second fastest growing uh, startup in Canada right now. He uh, he had subscription boxes. Oh yeah, you told me about this. And um, he had eight subscription boxes, and so, you know, subscription boxes like you know, every every ninety days, a cool little things of the month or whatever. Up, yeah, a little makeup, little this, little that. He had them in different niches: survival ones, women ones, makeup mm -hmm. ones, blah 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 blah. And uh, huge business, multiple eight figure business. And I said to him, "How did you? How, what was the lead generation source that you used to get it off the ground?" He said, "We bought magazines out." And I said, like, you put ads in magazines? No, 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 no. We bought the magazine. And I went, wow. I said, so that must have cost you a lot, right? So, oh, no, magazines are getting decimated right now. Nobody wants to advertise in magazines. Nobody's buying magazines anymore so off the shelf. So they acquired the publication? They acquired the publication. And not only did they acquire the publication, they acquired it for free. Oh, man, they must have been dying. They said, we will take over the debt load of the business, mm -hmm. you will give us these magazines. And then instead of having ads in them from other advertisers, they just put their subscription boxes on every single page. So now they completely dominated all of the lead generation of that source on something they acquired for free. And you, like, you, your, your head just goes, oh my God, that's so brilliant. Yeah. And, but, so but think about think about the other side of it is how many subscribers, paying subscribers, must they have already had? Obviously, they wouldn't have bought it if there was no list, right? No asset. So they just tapped into a whole list of current paid subscribers, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, he didn't go into much more detail with it than that. Is He basically said, we, got, we acquired the magazines for free, and we just took over their debt load, and then we put our ads in every magazine. And now, like, I know like half a dozen of the magazines that they own. Mm. <sighs> Because they're long established magazines, but magazines yeah. are really struggling. So there's always an opportunity, you know, everybody's looking at how, you know, how the world is right now and everything's struggling and blah, 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 blah. And as, as entrepreneurs, we have to look at like, where's the opportunity in this? That was a seemingly a desperate situation that they walked in, the magazine people were happy. They were happy. They built a 20,000, you know, person subscription business, you know, off of that always an opportunity there. And they went where somebody was living that everybody else was ignoring. Mm. Right. People said, Oh, there's nobody reading magazines anymore. I'm not going to advertise in there. And they went there and just crushed it. Yeah. It's a very counterintuitive way to think, which again, at the end of the day, I think the best businesses in the world have a counterintuitive element of them is where they're always looking to go maybe where someone isn't to stake some new ground, pioneer some new ground, but also maybe like Warren Buffett always says, Buy when there's blood in the streets. They'll yep. go. They'll go acquire that asset for pennies, or you said for free, and they'll tap into a whole list of buyers that maybe they never would have gotten to otherwise. Even if they had to buy it and invest in it, it still might have been worth it, right? Same with your newspaper guy. I can tell you yep. from 
you know, company, a company that I was running that, you, that you're aware of two, three years ago, we were doing a million bucks a year in spend on direct mail, even though we were an internet marketing company. I, I ran the whole direct mail division of the lead generation division of the internet marketing company. And it was like, wow. I mean, and, 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 and I can tell you that dollar for dollar, the customer value that came out the back door of the offline direct mail person was double to triple the value of the online person. Not saying go do that and do that only, does but it, it was a beautiful really balanced me. portfolio of probably 80% online, 20% off. And it just so happened that the 20% offline approach, they were a bigger, better, more astute customer. Because sure. they physically got something in the mail, they took the time to read it, they looked at the website, they went to the computer, they typed it in, they signed in, they watched the, I mean, it's tiring just talking about. They did all the steps to engage and consume. You would naturally not be surprised that they come out a more educated, more astute, better buyer. And, and you know, it's not difficult to sell to a person like that because they've gone through the channels that ultimately you want them to go through. Same with your newspaper guy. Same yeah. with this magazine guy. The direct mail example. The TikTok lawyer, right? All, you know, I guess talking lead gen today versus yesterday, I think the big lesson here is what worked yesterday probably doesn't work as good today, but the same psychology and the same principles and the same philosophies can be applied for sure to just more options. There's just way more options, and it just comes down to, to testing it, playing with it. And the reality is the testing and the playing with it for most of these is super, super cheap. It's not an expensive endeavor really? to test it out. And thinking about the perspective of, you know, going to where, where people live, like with direct mail, you know, I think a lot of people right now are like, nobody's no, but nobody even reads their mail anymore. It's I don't the same bias. You, is. It's my TikTok bias. It's your Pinterest bias, right? Automatic rejection, right? Of, yeah. Because I'm not. Therefore, they're not. Exactly. And, and we have a friend named Luke. I think you know Luke as well, who is absolutely smashing it with clients right now with direct mail. Why? Nobody's in it. There's no competition in the space. Everyone just assumes nobody opens up their mail anymore, right? Just another scenario where our confirmation bias plays in. Yeah. You know, and for me, what do I do? I'm you know, my agency focuses on the big four, right? Facebook, Instagram, Google, YouTube, right? So that's where we go. But we're starting to expand out into those other channels because we, we can see these soft seats in these other places. Mm -hmm. But our clients, because they're, they're all seven figure businesses and, and bigger, they, they're just zoned in on those four because that's where they, you know, feel like the, the future of their businesses. And, and, and it should be, you should be on those big four, but there's all these other options that are out there that that could be sitting right in front of your face. Yeah, and I think, and again, to piggyback off that last comment I made about the lesson here in this episode is this should be, the, lead gen today is a portfolio approach. Yeah. I think it always has been, but it's, it's a bigger portfolio approach today because there's so many more options. So back in the day, really good companies would have newspaper ads, magazine ads, and they would do direct mail, pre-internet, right? And they'd have people in the streets and they'd have salespeople. Today, like your direct mail guy, my, me, my direct mail example, um, the TikTok guy, right? Think about the balance there now. You could have an offline and an online balance. You might be on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, the big three online, yet you may still have a kick-ass USA Today ad and you may be in the mail. And now you are infinitely more stable with two offline medias and three online medias than you are with just the three online medias or just the two offline medias. You are, you know, very balanced at that point. At the end of the day, you know, talking in financial planning terms, a balanced portfolio wins most of the time. A yep. single focus portfolio wins. It can usually win big in the short term because you kind of hit something, but it usually loses bigger in the long term because it's so rely because it relies so much on the one, right? So again, the yeah. most dangerous number in business is one is, 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 is having one thing. And we kind of come from that era of we were, we were just Google advertisers because we, that was the only online option then. You and, and it was I talked, the best one. It, I mean, about, it, it worked. It was like the newspaper when the newspaper was the only game in town, right? And we were talking before the show, you and I about, you know, today. So how do you position yourself today with all of these options and it's a different lead gen approach today than it was then because today social media gives you, if used right, an unbelievable venue to brand yourself as if you're on TV, right? So yep. people people treat 
social media, the mistake I think that gets made, and I'd love your opinion on this, obviously, the mistake that gets made with social media today, in my view, is business owners make the mistake of not treating it like TV. Hence the TV show that we're on right now. We are 100%. doing a TV show, internet TV, by the way, um, without the big cost, right? We're doing an internet TV show. We're treating it like a TV show. We're treating it no different than an ESPN, Mike and Mike in the morning, two guys talking and shooting the you know what about the topic, right? Because social media can operate just like TV if you treat it like TV and you can get the same result that people have gotten for decades on TV. However, when you let social media become too personal, too emotional, too entertainment driven, you sort of lose the ability to gain the business benefit of branding yourself, positioning yourself and showing up. I mean, you can show up every day if you want it on a show like this and be front of mind, omnipresent in the face of your target audience. But most are very sporadic about it. So I, I, I want to get your take on how do you show up to play the lead gen game today on social media? Because it's where most people are. And if you show up the right way, a monster, monster business can be created by branding and positioning on social media. Yeah, and I think that that might be a topic for another call because it's long. Yeah. But, you know, what we see with our clients is that, you know, of all the people that are going to become a lead or a buyer for you in a pool, only about 2% of them get it right away. They'll, they'll quickly see your ad. So you can go into almost any form of social media and, and choose the size of audience you want. Do you want to market to your free audience, which is limited, those people who know you, like you, trust you, or do you want to go into paid and expand beyond people who don't know you? Mm -hmm. And, and when you, when you talk to somebody's pain and you offer them a solution and you give them a process to go through about 2% of people are just going to get that right yeah. out of the gates. It's a small but number. But then the, the other 98% of people who might've potentially become a lead or potentially become a sale they need, a, they need more time, they need more information, they need to know you more, they need to like you more, they need to trust you more, and they'll all buy along the, the timeline at different frames depending on if you continue to pick off their resistance. So what you can do in, in any industry, which is so beautiful about it these days, is you can basically say, here's my offer, boom, and if you're happy with just the 2%, you get the 2% and you're good. But then you can start to create content really zoning in on what might be their particular issues with moving forward with you and creating quality content around that and chipping away at the resistance mm -hmm. and continuing to constantly put that in front of the audience that you believe are your ideal prospects. And then all of a sudden you go from getting the 2% to getting 10%, 20%, 30%, 50%. And, and you end up, you know, creating a chokehold, I call it around that particular niche because you're just being seen so often mm. that that now people just believe that you're that guy. And, right. and I like to look at like somebody like a Grant Cardone as an example, right? Grant Cardone was a car salesman. Then Grant Cardone became a car salesman trainer, right? Nobody knew who he was. He was he was he was, you know, basically going, you know, dealership to dealership, right? Only people in the car sales world knew who Grant Cardone was. Right. Then he expanded out into entrepreneurial training and it became 10X. And then everybody all of a sudden knew who Grant Cardone was because he leveraged the power of social media by giving away value and content and, and so on and so forth. And now he's like, cool, I built, I built 10X. What's my next thing? Well, then he did Cardone U. And he did Cardone U for a while and it didn't quite have the same like pizzazz but it created another business entity and now it's all Cardone Capital, right? Even in the most recent book I bought from him, it's the whole thing is a pitch for Cardone Capital. Mm. So as great as 10X is, now he wants to create a whole different chokehold on a different area, i.e. I want to be the person that everybody thinks of when they think about investing in, you know, multiple unit apartment buildings. I want them to think Grant Cardone and come and give me their money, right? So he's just, he's just, chipping away at each one of these industries and becoming the go-to guy, you know, just by putting out content on a daily basis. And what the, and, and the, and the thing is, is that you don't even need to like them. Half the world hates them. <laughs> half, half the world likes them, but it's just about consistency and repetition. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a resisted thing also. Right. So I think it was Russell Brunson. I was listening to one of his podcasts recently 
And he said the number one focal point today, and you know, he's been around probably longer than us. He was, he's a pre-Google, pre-social media, pre-video guy too, for sure, right? And he said something along the lines of, you have to find a publishing platform on social today or you're sort of going to lose the game. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, publishing platforms. So what do we mean? We mean having a show like this, even having a podcast. This is a podcast as well. So this is, you know, the, the, the point here is, you get the video element and the audio element. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone when you do it TV live stream first, and then we grab the audio and make it a podcast second. So this is our publishing platform. Um, think about what yours could be from a lead generation standpoint. When you have a publishing platform, it could be a book, by the way. It could be a podcast. Those tend to be the big two today. Podcast is path of least resistance because you can have a show up in no time. But frankly, you could publish a book on Amazon in a weekend. So really path of least resistance. We talk about today versus yesterday. The path today to publish and be seen and to be omnipresent to feed your lead generation efforts is enormous and so readily available for the taking if you just get out of your own head, like we talked about earlier, and not think, well, I could never do that because what is my limiting belief, fill in the blank, right? I could never do that because fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. I could never write. I can't do this. I could never speak. I don't sign. Right? It's, 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 it's tiring to listen to, but we all do it as humans. Right, just limiting beliefs. But just think of those two: having a podcast, writing a book, and by the way, a book could be sixty pages of you teaching someone how to fill in the blank on a certain thing and telling your story. It's a it's a weekend write. Better yet, it's a weekend recorded on audio and then go have it transcribed because now you have a limiting belief that you can't look at white paper and write because you can't write because you can't speak English because you suck at grammar. So. You don't have to do it. You could talk it and give it to someone to edit and clean up, and now you have a book. Same thing with a podcast. You could talk on a platform like we're doing right now about your thing and about you and what you found and your discoveries, and it can be quick. This one's a little longer, but it could be 10, 15 minutes. And now you have a publishing platform, but what does that do to lead generation, to close like, to close the loop here, Aaron, is in your example of 2%, even if it's 5%, what do you do with the 95% that you invested time, money, and energy in who get away? Most business owners do nothing. It's painful to watch. They only focus on acquiring new, which is fine. And they just it's throw a money at it. They just throw more money boom, at boom, it. Boom, 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 boom. They'll, they'll live with their 97% get away percentage or they'll live with their 5%. Heck, if you're great, you're converting 10%. You're amazing. Online, cold traffic, cold whatever, cold direct mail, even, even lower, cold newspapers, everything we're talking, cold TikTok, doesn't matter. Cold traffic, cold advertisement, you're converting at 10%. You are in the Hall of Fame of advertising. But 90% are getting, you're not going anywhere with, with a 10% batting average, right? With, 100, with a, 100, a batting average of 100, right? 90% um, get away. However, if you publish, if you have a social media channel that you don't just post stuff on, but if you do a show, if you publish a podcast, if you have a book and you continue to produce content, give value and use that as a way to sort of take this TV approach, right? We talked about earlier in becoming visible. The game changer is how visible am I in my marketplace, in my world, right? You don't have to be visible to the whole world. You really need to be visible to the people in your world. And in most, most businesses have a niche. So this becomes infinitely easier because Facebook, for as an example, will, will allow you to essentially be in front of your audience. Google, Google doesn't allow that. Instagram and Facebook give you the ability to show your ads or show your publishing platform only to a certain audience, as you know, right? So think about how do you get to the other 90%? You get to the other 90% by being really visible and not just throwing money at the 10% because your cost for a lead will be so high if you only play the 10%. And I'm being really generous with, with this 10. It's probably more like five, right? I can see you like squirming on this 10% over here. No, 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 it's five, right? So if we play the 5% game, right? It, it, the like cost per lead, cost per acquisition just continues to go because you're playing in that tiny sliver of I'm spending, I'm in the hardest area, I'm in the hardest window, in the most expensive window to acquire a customer versus doing that, but yet focusing on publishing, visibility, omnipresence, using social like TV because the other 95%, not, not all of them will see you, but there's a good chance that half of them who got away will go, I just saw that ad or I just saw that offer. I see this guy, this girl everywhere now, and they're pretty sharp. And it's like they kind of come back around. So social it's not even today, the sharp part. You know, let's let's let's. You don't even this, have to be this, that sharp with this enough. final piece. It, you don't even have to be sharp. <laughs> you just have to be top of mind. Yeah, 
that's you it. don't even have you to know? be that good. You don't. You just need I to mean, be there. You just have to be there. But if right? you're good, At man, it moment. helps. If you're good, it helps. Yeah, I mean, if you're good, it helps. Don't yeah. don't get me wrong. But yeah. you know, we have a client together, Matthew Park. The other day, he said to me, "This this whole social media stuff you're making me do is is working because my last three clients I signed up said oh, I was thinking about getting started six months ago, and for whatever reason I didn't." But then I keep your videos are in my feed all the time. Perfect man. And then, example. Like, I saw him and I saw him and I saw him. And then I was like, yeah, I got to reach out to him. If they weren't there, there's no customer. He's the commercial that you keep seeing when you're watching football on Sunday. And you go, hey, honey, we should buy that new Clorox. Man, that stuff looks pretty strong to clean the counters with. You do I that. Use, I could use some Domino's pizza right yeah, now. Yeah, you know what? That Domino's, by the way, it looks way better on TV than it is in person. <laughs> I, I Listen, I did this last week, honestly, a month ago. Because my kids love it. The crust is so thick. I don't want to get off topic here. It is just, it, it's, it's not as good as it looks. Uh, but but you do it. It took six, seven, eight, nine, ten pops of, man, I'm hungry. Nobody wants to cook. It's Sunday. Game two's coming on. Yep. Right? And it's like, it works. But, it, but so that's TV. That's how we're all groomed. There's almost, there's not a lot of people on the planet. I mean, it's more our demographic and, and, and above, actually. But we came up with TV. And we came up with that exposure that has to go long before the first ad. That is how companies became companies back in the day pre-internet is they needed the repetitive viewership. They needed the repeat visibility past the initial. And that's what that, that today you get to use social media like TV without the exorbitant cost of TV. Absolutely. Which I think, like you said, I think it's a perfect topic um, for another episode is, is, is how do you tap social media for, for lead gen? But how do you do it right and not do it in a sporadic, cheesy way? I think that's as business owners and professionals, and that's mainly our audience. Our audience is companies and business owners who really you know, are sales-oriented people. They know that sales has to be the focal point of the damn business, or if nothing sells, nobody gets paid, nobody's around, right? That said, how do you use social media as a piece of the sales process puzzle without feeling awkward and cheesy and basically not having a strategy around it. And it's easily... Well, maybe that'll be well, maybe that'll be the end note for today. Maybe that'll be yeah. what we talk about next week. Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Is uh, It'll be one of the upcoming topics. But hey, we're live here in the Sales Velocity TV Facebook page uh, every Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern, at least at this time. That is the time. Um, this will be a podcast. It'll hit iTunes and Google Play probably shortly after the show is live. So join the group. Come on in. Join us every Friday. It's pretty much casual shop talk on how to sell more with less resistance and get the best result from whatever it is you're doing in your business. Because at the end of the day, um, if you're not selling and selling intelligently, you're not going to be around for long. So this was fun, my friend, episode one. It was a little raw, uh, off the cuff, but I think we pulled it off. I, I prefer it that way. To be honest. <laughs> hey, everybody, we'll see you next week for another episode of Sales Velocity TV. And hopefully we'll see you inside the podcast as well. Talk with you soon, my friend. We'll talk to you next week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Sales Velocity TV is powered by Pipeline Pro, the most powerful sales pipeline dashboard in existence. Built for business owners who want to see their entire sales pipeline from front to back and hold every stage of it and everybody involved accountable. Take a tour at www.gopipelinepro.com. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.